Oh, <laughs> I don't believe it. Oh my god, our Maple Leafs down 3-1 in this series, push it back to 7. And with what, 130 left in the third period, we collapse, the biggest collapse in Game 7 history. Oh my god, lose the series and the Boston Bruins off to the second round. Unbefreaking-leavable. I know you guys have been waiting for it, you guys have been waiting for to hear my opinions about the Toronto Maple Leafs in the playoffs and their unfortunate departure in Game 7 due to the Boston Bruins. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to spend some time here and basically just wrap up the Toronto Maple Leafs season, how I felt, how they played in the playoffs, you know, what to expect in the future, all that good stuff. It's just going to basically be a rant, okay? So, you know, coming into this playoffs, I did not have high expectations. I, you know... As soon as we matched up against the Boston Bruins, I was thinking to myself, oh, we could have we could have not have drawn a worse team. I'd rather face the Pittsburgh Penguins. I'd rather face the Montreal Canadiens. Even though these guys finished up higher in the standings in a shortened regular season, the Boston Bruins are a tried true playoff team. You know what I mean? Um, you can say that you're giving 110% during the regular season, but as soon as that puck drops on a playoff game for the first time, the intensity amps up. Every player knows that, you know, they're playing for real. Something just changes and when the Boston Bruins are in that environment they're a different team man and you know the first game it was obviously Boston you know they, I didn't think it was going past five I thought for sure that Boston would win the first two games we'd maybe win game three or game four you know one game at home and then back in game five for Boston they would take that so you know after the game one when we lost that I think it was like four to two or four to one I wasn't really that surprised I really wasn't that uh, worried because I didn't have high expectations for this playoff round, right? Game 2 came along then, and I... Uh gave me a little bit of hope. Let's just say that. Phil Kessel, first of all, getting the game winner on a breakaway in Boston, that to me put a smile on my face right there. You know, even if, because I was still thinking, you know, we're still going to lose in five. We're still going to lose in six. I was just hoping for a competitive six games. You know what I mean? That's all I wanted, a competitive six games. And here we are, game two in Boston, and Phil Kessel gets the game winner on a breakaway. That to me was a great story in itself. And it had me thinking like, holy shit, now we're going back to Toronto, and all we need to do is win shut up phone all we need to do is win one of those games and we got a 2-2 split and that itself is a competitive six games we've guaranteed ourselves a game six in the air canada center if we can make it two to two and then what happens you know this the, this, the crazy series continues to be crazy we lose two at home games three and great and game four and you know what game four was a big one too because everyone was getting on dion funuf that was the game where we went to overtime we dominated the game. We even dominated in overtime. Dion Phaneuf took a pinch, trying to body check Nathan Horton. Missed him. Uh, Horton pinched it up or uh, chopped it up to uh, Krejci. Krejci went in, waited all day. Some say James Reimer should have had that, but whatever. It was a two-on-one point blank. Put it in, and the Boston Bruins went up 3-1, to one, and a lot of uh, Toronto Maple Leaf fans thought it was over, including myself, you know. I thought it would be 3-1 to one after 4. I just thought we'd win one at home and lose two on the road. We won one on the road and lost two at home, but it was still 3-1, to one, right? And I, I got pissed off at everyone getting mad at Dion Phaneuf that game. Yeah, he took a pinch, yeah, but... You know, that's what sports are. You know, the only time goals are going to go in is when a mistake happens on the other side of it. You know, look back at that game. If anyone watched Game 4, I know it's it's a while ago now, but Game 4, we were up 2 nothing at the end of the first period. And does anyone remember what Nazem Kadri did at the end of the first period? The high-sticking double minor that put Boston on a power play for 4 minutes? Where I didn't hear anyone complaining about Nazem Kadri after that game. And we had a 2 nothing again, we had a 2 nothing lead at the end of the first period. He takes that uh, high-sticking double minor and what happens? Boston gets that one goal. I think it was like 20 seconds into the second period, right? I didn't hear anyone talking about Nazem Kadri that game. No, 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 no. It's just the the play in which it happened on Phaneuf. Oh, get him out of here. Get him out of here. Throw him out of here. He's garbage. And, you know, it was running through my mind, too, and I really wanted to see how he would... Um, react to that because it was clearly his fault no doubt about it but still I just didn't like how people were basically castrating him you know people who have never played hockey in their lives blaming him but whatever um, and he comes back and has a great games five game six he didn't look down he didn't get down on himself all right he got a big uh, goal there in game six 
And you know, <laughs> game five to me, the one back in Boston, I thought for sure Boston would win that one. But that's what I love about playoff hockey. You know, a team plays completely different when their backs are against the wall. It's the same thing like I was talking about before when the regular season to the playoffs. You say you're trying 100% during the regular season, but something just changes when you're in the playoffs. Well, something just changes when you know your back is against the wall as well. And when Boston is up 3-1, to one, naturally, in their, in their conscious, I mean, Boston is just thinking to themselves, yeah, we're going to try, but, I mean, we got this in the bag. It's the Toronto Maple Leafs. They're down 3-1. to one. They're not going to come back to Boston twice and beat us, you know? So they got that in the back of their head. Well, the Toronto Maple Leafs, they got nothing to lose, and they're pushing, they're pushing full gear, you know, pedal to the metal. And what happens? We take games, uh, we take game five, we take game six, and all of a sudden we put the Boston Bruins with their back up against the wall now, and they turn into a different team, right? And what happened there in game seven? I mean, we even had Air Canada sabotage the Boston Bruins airplane, and it still didn't, uh, still didn't work out. I mean, we had that 4-1 lead with like 12 minutes left in the third period or 10 minutes left. You know, that should be enough for any team in the NHL to, to defend against any other NHL team. But that's when it snapped. You know, Boston turned into that you know, kind of just uh, go with the flow team to a team with its backs up against the wall, truly up against the wall. Down by three in the third period in the game seven, you have to turn it around. And I look at Matt Fratton's breakaway, man. He had it. Didn't need another goal there, but he could have iced it there. Missed that. I don't see anyone giving Matt Fratton hell, which is good. We didn't need another goal. Um, but then, you know, they came back. Bergeron tied it up. Lucic, who is just a friggin' force when he's around the net there at the end of the game. He almost tied, he almost tied it in game six. All right. Then he almost, uh, well, he, he got us, he got them in within one in game six and in game seven. And then once they tied it, you could just, you could just feel that it was not going our way. You know, you could just feel in overtime that the, uh, the comeback was going to be complete. And even in overtime, you know, we had some chances. Joffrey Lupel had a good one-timer, and then he had a good uh, wraparound backhand chance that could have gone in. But, you know, it just wasn't going our way, and then they come down the ice. And that's when the pressure starts. It really starts to show the difference between a veteran team and a rookie team, you know. Once they got it 4-2, you could you could tell we turned into a bunch of little kids, not knowing what the hell to do, you know. Playing not to lose, not playing to win. And that was the problem. Boston, they've done this. They've been there, all right. 2011, three game sevens. They know what it means to play when everything is on the line. We just couldn't close it out. And that's the problem. But you know what? I'm not mad at any of the Leafs. I'm not mad at any of the coaches, the training staff, anything like that. And in fact, um, the way I want to wrap up this series is I first would like to thank and congratulate the Boston Bruins for a great competitive series. Uh, those guys really showed why they are the better team. No doubt the better team won the series. And I have a newfound respect for the, uh, not the Boston Bruins, but Patrice Bergeron. That guy is pure class. After Game 7 getting that overtime win, uh, just the interview that he had really just made me respect him a lot more. Pure class by Patrice Bergeron and the Boston Bruins. You know, it was a chippy series. There were some elbows thrown, but, you know, that's hockey. At the end of the day, it was a great competitive series. I don't think there was a single fight, right? It was just... It was a great series, and if I'm going to lose, if the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to lose, I'm glad it was to a team like the Boston Bruins. Because, again, I go back to what I said at the beginning of the uh, video here. You know, the Boston Bruins, they're the team that I did not want to face at all in the, in the Eastern Conference. And we took them to seven. I'm looking at next year, and I'm thinking there's no team in the Eastern Conference that we can't be competitive with. And as a young team, we're only going to get better. So the future is looking very bright for the Toronto Maple Leafs. This was a step that had to be taken. We had to lose in overtime. You know, we had to lose that game seven, that first round. You know, like think about all the teams that had those dynasties. You know, in the earlier years, they had those upsets. And our young guns are going to learn from this experience. A game is not over until it's over. What did we learn? When you're down 3 1 in the series, it's not over. And when you're up 4 1 in the third, it's not over, okay? Going forward, those will be great lessons for our team. But now we can get into the hardware. Why did we lose the series, you know? Um. To me, it's pretty simple. You know, you can just ba uh, boil it down to the Boston Bruins up and down the roster are a better team. You can pick out players on the Toronto Maple Leafs that are good, maybe better than the opposing player on the Boston Bruins, but I'm talking about up and down the roster, first to fourth line, you know, top two to top six defensemen, depth for when injuries happen, goaltender, they have the better team, all right? More veteran, more grizzly team, um, conditioned for a playoff run. Tuka Rask played like a god. Reimer played great too, I'm not saying anything like that, they were pretty even, but uh, the difference to me in Boston is their third line. You know, when their first and second line isn't getting it done, well, the Yager, Peverly, and uh, Kelly line could still come out there and maybe not score a goal, but really pressure us. And... And 
the way I look at our third line is it's atrocious. Now, I know people are going to be saying, oh, Kuhlman and Grabowski, they had great series. Grabowski was getting checked everywhere, getting back up. And I agree with that. You know, the kid put in together, uh, well, he put together a pretty good seven games and he didn't get injured. And even though he didn't get points, you know, he, he tried to earn that five and a half million dollars. But to me, that's where we need to improve. I mean, Grabowski and Kuhlman, all right, I'll just throw out some stats here. Seven games played in the playoffs, all right, zero goals each. One assist for Kuhlman, two assists for Grabowski. Kuhlman was a minus nine. Grabowski was a minus 10, okay? So let's just focus on Grabowski right here because I think he has to go before Kuhlman. Yes, he was getting body checked. Yes, he was showing effort. Yes, he was getting back up. Yes, 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 all this stuff, right? But he's not a first liner. He's not a second liner. He's a third liner on our team, okay? Does he win faceoffs? No. Does he kill penalties? No. So he is a goal scorer. He is he is a point producer. And he has two points to show in seven games played as a minus 10, okay? I don't care if he shows all the effort in the world. He's still not getting it done. We need a third line full of players who can keep the puck out of our net and with a touch of, of offensive talent, you know? Not a Jay McClement, because Jay McClement is a fourth liner who kills all the penalties and wins faceoffs. I'm talking about just... It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Tyler Bozak is a perfect third liner if we could replace him on the first line, you know, but I think that third line has got to be completely revamped if we want to be a good playoff team going forward. And that's really only the the thing that I have, the only real problem that I had with our playoff run this year, you know. Um, I felt as a young team against the Boston Bruins, we played great. You can nitpick little things here and there that we got to get good at, but we went up against a team that knows how to keep the puck in our zone, all right? One of the best teams at it. The best best face-off team in the NHL, so we're always starting, they're always starting with the puck, we always have to start on defense, right, and we push them to seven, I think we just need a better third line, all right, let me show you guys, actually, I'll put it up on the screen for you guys, right, going forward, all right, you got the first line, the way I look at it, you got JVR in the left, you got Kessel on the right, and then you got in the center, Kadri and Bozak, you don't know who's number one, you don't know who's number two, Technically, right now, Bozak is number one just because he can win faceoffs. He's got the experience, and he actually has pretty good chemistry with Kessel. Kadri, he's not going to win faceoffs, so you don't put him out there for a power play because you don't trust him to win that power play faceoff in the offensive zone. You don't put him out there in a defensive zone faceoff either, so that limits Kadri's minutes. Basically, what Kadri doesn't have, Bozak does, and what Bozak doesn't have, Kadri has. So right now, you kind of have a uh, two second liners in Kadri and Bozak, and because we don't have a first liner. You know, you have to kind of decide going forward which one do you want. You know, certain games you play this guy here, certain games you play that guy there. Especially with Randy Carlisle and his crazy line changes, right? So, uh, you don't know what you're getting right there. Second line, you got Lupul and Fratton on the wings. And again, centered by Kadri and Bozak. But then the third line, you got nobody. I think Clark MacArthur is going to come back next year. And I think Kuhlman's going to come back. But uh, I think you got to completely revamp that third line. I don't like any of those players there. So, if I'm looking at this team going forward, we need to fill up that that third line with new talent. Joe Colburn maybe could be one of them, but we need to fill it up with new talent. And then the fourth line, you got your tough guy on the left with Orr McCle uh, or McLaren, or on the right, and you got McClement, who's been a great player for us this year, definitely has to come back. And then you got Leo Komarov, who's been a great little pesky player out there. He can be on the checking line. But you see what I mean? We need that third line. That's what the Leafs are missing right there. You need that third line. And I mean, you got the expendable forwards, MacArthur, Grabowski, and Kuhlman. That's our third line right now, but to me, all of them can go. You need better defensive players who can win face-offs and kill penalties right there. You know, basically McClement type players with just a little bit more offensive touch. And then defensively going forward, you know, you got Fanuf, Franzen, which has been great for us now. So Franzen and Gardner might be your one-two punch going forward. You know, they may even take over for Fanuf. Um, but I think, you know, Fanuf is still the first liner with Franzen. But uh, the way Carlisle does it, I mean, you may see Fanuf with Gunnarsson. You may see Fanuf with Lyle sometimes. So you don't really know. Um, Gardner, I would still say, is a second liner. You know, he had a good playoffs, but he has to have a, a full good season before he takes over just yet. But I would love to see Gardner on our first line power play. I, I'd rather see Gardner move the puck up the ice than Fanuf. He's just a much better skater, and he can get it into the zone. But Fanuf, yeah, he's the captain, so you got to give him the time, right? And then Frazier broke his skull for us, so he's got to come back next year. But the expendable defenseman, O'Byrne, Lyles, Koska, and Holzer, right? So you got to figure out, you know, defensively, we have to get better. I'm not going to lie. Defensively, we have to get better, older. Uh, we just have to... we got to learn from our experience here, you know? Gardner is good going forward. Franzen is good. But uh, you got some players there that you just don't know about just yet, you know? Like, you're not... 
you're not set in stone like you are about Kessel and JVR, the same way you are about uh, uh, even Fanuf and Gunnarsson and Frazier, right? So defense could be uh, shaped up a little bit, but then you go to goaltender and James Reimer, thank God we did not tra uh, trade for Mika Kiprasov or Roberto Luongo. Um, I've been hearing people say that James Reimer was all his fault in Game 7. Shut the hell up. You're a bandwagon Leaf fan, all right? Reimer got us to Game 7 in Games 5 and 6 and 4, okay? And he played fine in Game 7. Our team just collapsed around him, okay? So, I don't blame James Reimer at all. Uh, he's young. He's going to get older. In fact, our oldest player, our oldest core player is uh, Joffrey Lupel, 29 years old. He'll be starting next year at 30 years old. So, that's what I mean. We're a young team. We just had to take this loss in stride, get better from it, and come back next year. I just hope that... Um, I just hope that, uh, oh, what's his name? I was about to say uh, Brian Burke, Dave Nonis. I just hope that he feels the same way I do about that third line because that has got to be completely revamped, all right, going forward. But Leaf fans, you know what? Hold your heads high. It's been a great year. It's been a great playoff run. We were a competitive team against a Stanley Cup contender, in my opinion, right? The farther Boston goes, the, the better we got to feel about ourselves. And uh, you know what? Next year, we're going to come back stronger. So once again, Leaf fans, hold your heads up high. I'd like to thank the Boston Bruins for a great uh, series. Good luck going forward. Forward. And uh, yeah, that's just how it is. Great year for the Toronto Maple Leafs, all right? Great year. I love this year. It was a great one. So I look forward to seeing you guys next year. And uh, don't worry, I can smell that second round, all right? So I will see you guys next year.